today we kick off a new series focused on Islamic banking and finance. Although a relatively new industry, it is one that experts say is growing at a rate of near 20 percent per year. And that's fueled by both the rising levels of wealth among Muslim populations and ironically the ongoing global banking crisis. But well, we start now by looking at the basic principles of modern Islamic finance, its history and the challenges Islamic banks face in growing worldwide. Our guest today is Ibrahim Ward. He's an adjunct professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He has authored countless articles as well as three books on Islamic finance. His most recent is Islam and Economics. Welcome, Professor Ward. It's great to have you. Thank you, Lisa. Let's start with the basic tenets of Islamic finance, you know, governed, of course, by Sharia law. What does this mean from a practical perspective? I mean, I think a number of people know that interest is not allowed in Islamic finance, but it's more than just that. Yeah, uh, everybody knows about this prohibition of what is known as riba, which is usually translated as interest. Uh, but the broader principles uh, go back to this uh, principle that you should not make money with money, which practically means, first of all, that Islamic finance must always be directly linked to the real economy. Uh, another principle of Islamic finance is the principle of risk sharing as well as profit and loss sharing. Uh, yet another principle is to avoid speculation. And, uh, and I would say these are the, the three most, uh, most important features of, uh, of the principle of Islamic finance. And of course, uh, there is basically the idea that ethics uh, must be central to, to Islamic finance. And we were just talking about the basic tenets, Professor Ward, of um, Muslim or Islamic finance. And one of the things you had mentioned to me was the link between um, the way that you're making money and the real economy, that there shouldn't be too much of a separation. Uh, yeah, I think this goes back to the very history of Islam and how it relates to economics and finance. Namely, that uh, Islam was born in the city of Mecca, which was a center of trade. And uh, the Prophet uh, Muhammad was himself a merchant. So unlike other religions, uh, w uh, which tended to look down upon uh, money making, uh, Islam has generally a positive attitude towards commerce and uh, does not necessarily look down on wealth, uh, provided that uh, the wealth uh, is actually obtained in, a, in an Islamically acceptable way, uh, which precisely means that it contributes to uh, welfare and productivity. And in that sense, making money with money is what Islam, uh, like other traditions, objects to. You know, at the same time, Professor Ward, in our conversations, you know, you've explained some of the ways that the Islamic institutions can use or create sort of the same tools that Western financial institutions create. So I want to talk about the, you know, the notion of no interest and no debt. There are different methods by which they kind of achieve the same things for the populations they're serving. Yeah, maybe we should also say that there's always a gap between the theory and uh, practice. Uh, so the theory is one thing. Uh, the, the practice uh, does not always approximate the, what the underlying principles are. But uh, basically, uh, there are a number of transactions uh, that are acceptable in Islamic finance, such as leasing uh, or uh, sales transactions. Uh, and uh, what Islam tries to avoid is uh, straightforward interest-based uh, lending. So uh, what the most common Islamic products uh, attempt to do, and I'm saying attempt because they don't necessarily always uh, do it, is uh, make sure that there is this correspondence between the uh, underlying economic activity and the financial uh, transaction. So Islamic banks uh, do provide financing, except that this financing uh, takes a variety of forms that are all based on uh, traditional Islamic contracts and Islamic ways of doing business. 
Professor Ward, very quickly, we, unfortunately we only have about 45 seconds here, but you have written specifically on the topic of terrorism as it relates to the growth of Islamic banks. Um, you know, there tends to be a knee-jerk reaction by many Western populations when they hear of Islam and they hear about Islamic institutions. There are a number of challenges even beyond this sort of misperception, but I wanted you to address that one specifically. Well, whenever there's a prejudice against Islam, uh, then almost automatically there are going to be suspicions about the money. But having done a lot of empirical work on that subject and actually written a whole book on that subject, uh, there has been no evidence that any Islamic institution was actually involved in uh, financing terrorism. And it's logical because uh, if you're a terrorist, you know precisely how not to get caught. And you know that if you go to an Islamic institution, then there's going to be greater scrutiny. All right, Professor Ward, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. That was Ibrahim Ward, adjunct Thank professor you. at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University.